Welcome to CCI Toronto's Condo Convos, casual chats about important condominium topics. Today's topic is how to pass and enforce rules. Listen in and be on your way to achieving social and financial success at your condo. Condominium living is community living. In any community, we need rules to govern behavior to ensure that, essentially, everyone can get along and live in harmony. Rules in reality are about being considerate to your neighbors. If all residents understood that you don't use a garbage chute at 2 a.m. in the morning when the garbage room shares a wall with someone else's bedroom, or that you don't have loud parties and blast music when you know that your neighbors are going to be sleeping, we wouldn't need rules. But we do. So today we're going to talk about rules and how they're passed and enforced. So I'm going to take a minute to introduce my panel. And we have uh, to my left Anne Nguyen, from Gard uh, lawyer with Gardner Miller Arnold, Tim Duggan, a lawyer with Horlick Levitt, and Laura Lee, property management, a property manager with Dell Property Management. So I'd like to start off by talking a little bit, or perhaps Tim, you can tell us a little bit about the difference between a rule and a bylaw. Thanks, Warren. There's two main differences between a rule and a bylaw. The first is uh, with respect to subject matter. Most rules deal with matters of uh, conduct, so-called people, pets, and parking type issues, whereas most bylaws deal with governance type issues. The second main difference is with respect to process. Now, both rules and bylaws uh, may, bylaws do require a vote of the owners, rules may, but the rule process uh, doesn't necessarily require a, a vote of the owners. So the way that the procedure typically works is the board decides what kind of rule they want to pass. They may go to the owners uh, for consultation on this. They may circulate a survey or have a town hall type meeting to get input from the owners. Once the board's decided what they want to put into the rule, they figure out the outline of the rule, deal with the corporation's lawyer, put together the text of the rule. The notice of the rule gets sent to the owners and the owners are notified that they have 30 days to requisition a meeting to vote on the rule. If 15% of the owners sign a requisition, then there's a meeting held and you have a simple yes or no vote at the meeting to decide whether or not the rule is approved. If there is no quorum at the meeting, then the rule is approved. If there is quorum and the, the owners vote in favor, then the rule is approved. If there's no requisition submitted within that 30-day period, then the rule becomes effective on day 31. Okay. Um, uh, Laura, perhaps you can tell us a little bit from a practical perspective at the condominium level um, about you know, how you would be communicating uh, matters with respect to the rules to the owners and so on. Communicating with owners is a, a key component to uh, successfully passing your rules. As Tim alluded to, uh, sometimes owners disagree with a rule and try and requisition a meeting. That's your worst case scenario. Uh, you really want to communicate with your owners as to the reason behind uh, why, you, why you have the rules and in accordance with the Act, that would be for safety, security, or for the in quiet enjoyment of the premises for the, for the residents. So it's in the best interest of the residents to really have the rules in place. They're not necessarily as do's and don'ts for living in a condo. So uh, having a town hall is really important. Uh, even um, in, when you're t sending out your set of rules, if it's one rule, explain why the rule is necessary. And if uh, it's several rules, maybe you, you, ex you have a comparison. Oftentimes, uh, like lawyers will submit to you their general package of rules. So you're doing them as an entire package. And each lawyer that, that drafts the rules drafts them quite differently. So it's really important that to, to a layman or to an owner, they can see the difference because immediately when they get a package, a big package in the mail, why do I have to read all this? What have you changed? They think that there's some hidden small fine print. So the more you can make it uh, user friendly, the, the more successful you'll be. In my experience, especially with a rule dealing with a controversial topic like uh, all the cannabis rules that we had passed for condos last year as an example, uh, it does really help when it comes time for that owner's meeting to have that town hall meeting ahead of time. A, so that the owners feel like they've had input into the process and B, so the owners understand a lot of those issues that might not be evident on the face of the rule and they have a chance to ask questions before you get to the ultimate meeting to vote on the rule. I also think it's really important to listen to your owners. If it's a minor change that they want to the rule, make the change. Uh, rather than arguing with them uh, over something that is insignificant. Okay. Um, now, I often hear board members and, and managers sometimes ask if they can pass a bylaw. 
um, instead of implementing a rule. And, and is there any benefit to including um, what you may include in a rule in a bylaw? Maybe Anne, you can... Uh, yeah, so certainly there's a, a hierarchy to uh, the corporation's governing documents. It goes declaration, bylaws, and rules. Um, bylaws and rules, they both have to be reasonable, um, but they're both enforceable as well. You'd probably want to pass um, bylaws for governance and operation, like Tim had said earlier, and save the day-to-day -day, um, conduct kind of rules. Like Tim mentioned people, pets, and parking for rules and also because rules are easier to pass as well rather than bylaws. Okay. But, but can you take something that you would have in a rule and put it into a bylaw? Conceivably, yes. If they fall under the, um, the, the areas or the headings of uh, section 56 and mainly those deal with governing um, operations and whatnot. But um, there are overlaps, for example, um, there is uh, in section 56 um, Use, enjoyment of use of common elements. There's that element in section 56 that might be applicable, depending on the scenario. Okay, excellent. Um, now, I often have clients also um, talk to me about implementing policies instead of rules. And um, why would this be a problem, if it is in fact a problem? Um, Tim, maybe you can shed some light on that. So the Act doesn't really speak to policies per se, and so the, the obvious issue would be one of enforcement. The Act sets out certain mechanisms for enforcing rules, uh, either by mediation arbitration or by way of a court application if things get to that point. But there's no equivalent uh, procedure in the Act uh, with respect to a policy. So if it's something substantive that the corporation may want to be able to enforce, like a, a noise provision or like a parking provision, I would always recommend that that go in by way of a rule. Where a board might want to pass a policy in lieu of a rule would be something simple like facility hours for a gym or a swimming pool. And the benefit of doing that sort of small thing by way of a policy is it's much more flexible later on for the board to change it if they decide that they want to change the gym hours to 8 to 8 instead of having it 9 to 7, for example. So let's talk a little bit about how rules are enforced. Let's say a resident's making too much noise. It's very late at night. How does the corporation go about dealing with that initial noise complaint? And Laura, maybe you can um, fill us in on this. Yeah, I would recommend that, uh, obviously, that uh, as soon as the complaint comes in, that someone goes and verifies the complaint. Oftentimes when, let's say, it's security going to the door, they can't hear the noise. It might be a, a child in a back room with his door closed, gaming, and the, you know, the lady downstairs is 85 years old and she sleeps in the same room that the child does. Uh, so it's very important for it to verify the noise. And one of the things I always say to owners when they complain, is it okay if I come to your unit after? They go, so say they go to the unit and they say the unit upstairs is, is creating noise. They go, they can't hear anything outside. It's good that they can go back to the one that complained and go into that unit and actually hear the noise so they can verify what they're actually looking for. And depending on the time of day, you can knock on the door and speak to the people upstairs and, and find out what exactly is going on. Seeing, uh, like we've had recently, even ones where somebody's doing exercise, they're skipping in their living room, uh, or someone's playing piano, you know, like simple, simple complaints that it sounds like someone's pounding on the floor, or, you know, there's a kid playing ball against the wall. And literally, there's no kid playing ball against the wall. There's something completely different happening, someone pounding meat, for instance. So it's very important to verify the noise and, and someone witness it. And then oftentimes, the, you have the complainers that always complain about noise. It, you maybe deem it not a nuisance, depending on the particular time of day. Not that there's any, uh, there's never a good time to play loud music and even the city will inter interject uh, depending on how loud the music is. People think after 11 o'clock it's okay, but even before 11 it isn't, depending on the level. So I suggest that you, you do verify it. So, so once you do verify, um, or let's assume that you've verified the noise, what would happen next? So we always suggest that, that we send the initial letter. The initial letter is kind of a calm letter. You may not be aware, your noise is disturbing other people. We live in a condominium, noise will travel. Um, second letter escalates, it says, as per the rules and regulations, and then you quote the regulation. The third might be, hey, we've already told you, we've sent you two previous letters, 
we're going to take legal action and that's going to be at your expense. And then the fourth is typically a legal letter that the owner then gets a bill from one of the lawyers from. Okay. Thank you. Um, so what are some of the other steps that maybe can be taken before uh, the condominium has to go legal? We can always investigate uh, the noise and take a block of units. So take the neighboring units on either side, above and below, and actually go into the units and try and recreate the noise during the day. Uh, so you can find the sound level on the TV that actually creates the disruption, whether it's 27 or whether it's 43. Um, sometimes just pulling the TV away from the wall or lifting the stereo speakers off the floor. It'll make a difference from the vi sound and vibration. Um, there, there might be also um, an opportunity to speak to the, the, uh, the offender. Sometimes they don't understand um, that loud music is um, traveling from their unit. And in some circumstances, it might be appropriate, I think, to speak to the complainant so that they understand the reasonable expert expectations of living in close quarters. The corporation would deal uh, with um, complaints about a dog barking very differently from a baby crying, right? I think, too, if it's a tenant, you make sure you speak to the owner as well and keep them in the loop. Excellent. Um, you mentioned deeming uh, something not to be a nuisance or a nuisance. So sometimes rules actually have discretion built in, um, like a dog being a nuisance, uh, it, you know, as deemed a nuisance in the sole discretion of the board or management. And um, perhaps, Tim, you can shed some light on, on how, you know, we have to deal with that discretion that may be built into a rule. So depending on the nature of the rule, it may be appropriate to have discretion for uh, the reasons that Laura and Anne mentioned. There may be specific circumstances where um, investigating the matter management and, and then the board come to the conclusion that enforcement steps are or are not uh, reasonable in the circumstances, but reasonableness is the keystone there. It's necessary at all times whenever the board's exercising any sort of discretion for that discretion to be exercised reasonably. That doesn't mean that the board has to come to the conclusion that an outside observer, whether it's a court or an arbitrator, would say is the best answer. It's just a question of whether that answer is reasonable in the circumstances. And so evidence-based decision making is very important and, and that whole evidence gathering process really becomes important when it comes time to an enforcement proceeding to be able to satisfy a court or an arbitrator that the board did act reasonably in deeming the dog a nuisance or in deeming the noise to be a nuisance, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Um, Anne, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what happens when the matter actually goes to the lawyer. So typically management will let us know um, that there's a specific incident or rule breach. Um, it'll be accompanied with security reports, management reports, investigations, the stuff that Laura had mentioned. Um, we would assess it if it's adequate evidence, um, then we would issue a compliance demand letter. Um, if that doesn't get any results, then we move on to um, maybe in the circumstances, maybe one or two more letters or mediation and arbitration. And um, if it's an owner, then we do media mediation arbitration um, as preconditions to a court application for compliance. And if it's a tenant, then if the owner is unwilling or unable to get their tenant's compliance, then uh, there's no obligation for mediation, arbitration, just straight uh, court application. Okay, excellent. And one concern that I know every condo always has when they're dealing with enforcement is uh, charging back the costs to the owners. So maybe, Tim, you can tell us a little bit um, about that. So depending on the nature of the issue, the corporation may have uh, certain avenues available for recovering the costs. Uh, most condominium corporations governing documents have indemnification provisions that provide something to the effect of any costs incurred by the corporation to address any breach of the declaration bylaws rules or by reason of an act or omission of an owner, etc., uh, can be recovered from the owner in the same manner as common expenses. And so those indemnification provisions uh, can be helpful tools for the condominium corporation when they're dealing with the uh, letter writing stage after things have gone from management to the lawyer and the lawyer is getting involved to write letters. If things progress to court and uh, you're in a court application, there's a separate power under Section 134 of the Act to recover the full cost of the application from the owner if the, in the event that the corporation is successful in the application. The, the general principle is that if the corporation is reasonably pursuing compliance, it shouldn't be doing so at the cost of all the innocent unit owners. The cost should be borne by the owner who's in breach of the rules or the owner who is failing to take uh, sufficient steps to address a tenant's breach of the rules in the example that Anne gave. Excellent. 
Excellent. So one thing I take from what you just said is corporations really want to make sure they have good indemnification provisions. Very important. How does human rights play into enforcement? Because human, you know, we always get these issues uh, arise um, when it comes to rules, often with pets, um, sometimes with, with smoking or, or cannabis. So Anne, maybe you can talk to us a little bit about how human rights plays into the whole rule enforcement. Sure. So the Human Rights Code um, requires, it recognizes that everybody has different needs and there's different solutions so that everyone can participate equally. Um, depending on the scenario, um, it might mean uh, exempting someone from rule enforcement. And like you mentioned, a uh, pet, for example, a uh, service animal in a no pets building. Uh, part of the corporation's duty to accommodate is to consider requests for accommodation. And those requests should be taken seriously and not dismissed and dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and uh, in most cases, corporations should seek legal uh, advice because of the nuances in each different scenario. You've all heard the saying um, that fences make good neighbors. Well, in a condo, good rules make good neighbors. But more important than having good rules is that residents understand what it means to live in a multi-unit uh, setting and the importance of being considerate of your neighbors and taking the necessary steps to follow the rules that are in place. Condominium living is not for everyone, but for those who see that all the condo living has to offer and choose to live in a condo, the obligation to follow the rules goes hand in hand with all of the benefits that you get from living in a condo. I'd like to thank my panel, Laura Lee, Ann Nguyen, and Tim Duggan for their, taking their time today. My name is Warren Kleiner, and I'd like to thank you all for watching. Have a great day, and happy condo living.